Welcome back to our confirmation prep sessions. We are on session five now, focusing on the church. So the first session we looked at the problem of evil. Then we looked at who is God the Father, who is God the Son, who is God the Holy Spirit. Those three persons together form the one God, the Holy Trinity, that we follow as Catholic Christians. So today we're going to take a look at what is this community, this church, that God founded in the world today? What is it, what is it supposed to do, uh, and what is our role in it? So let's start off with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord God, we thank you for creating us in your image uh, to be, uh, to desire community, to desire friends. Um, and we thank you for this community of the church that you've given to us. God, we ask you to please help us to be the best members of this body that we can be, uh, to help keep your church healthy and strong, and to fulfill the mission that you have given us in this world. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So for our scripture reflection today, we're taking a look at Matthew chapter 16. So if you remember that Bible hack, you take your Bible, divide it in half, take the chunk in your right hand, divide that in half, you're probably in one of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. We're looking at Matthew, the very first Gospel there, chapter 16, starting in verses 13 and going, going from, from verses 13 through 20. Um, this is just an absolutely loaded passage. There's a lot of stuff going on in here. We're going to just skim the surface of it here today. But if you got your Bibles, open up to Matthew 16. 13 to 20. I'll read through it out loud a couple times and then invite you to hit pause and reflect on what jumps out to you. When Jesus went into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter said in reply, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus said to him in reply, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my heavenly Father. And so I say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of the netherworld shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly ordered his disciples to tell no one that he was the Messiah. When Jesus went into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter said in reply, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him in reply, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my heavenly Father. And so I say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of the netherworld shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly ordered his disciples to tell no one that he was the Messiah. So I'd invite you to hit pause on the video and just kind of sit with and reflect and ask the Lord, why are you bringing this to my attention? Perhaps what jumped out to you was Caesarea Philippi, wondering where what, where Caesarea Philippi, why is that important? We'll get to that in a minute. This is one of the two places in all of the Gospels where Jesus uses the word church. He only does it twice. Right here in the other place is also Matthew's Gospel, Matthew 18, 17, where he talks about the church mediating between disputes. So this is probably a pretty important passage to figure out what did Jesus have in mind by founding a church. And it says that he founds it on Peter. He gives the keys of the kingdom to Peter, right? You can think about, uh, you know, if I give you my set of keys here, what am I giving you? I'm giving you authority. I'm giving you access, right? You can get into my house. You can get into my car. Uh, you can let anybody into my house or my car, right? Giving you keys symbolizes authority as it did in the ancient world, right? Think of giving someone the key to the city. That's a symbolic thing now, right? Uh, but in the ancient world, it was a literal key <laughs> that a prime minister would, would wear around their neck, symbolizing their authority, and they could actually physically unlock or lock the gates of the city. Right? So Jesus gives these, these keys to Peter, reminiscent of the prime minister in the Davidic kingdom, right? who personally represented the king. You can think today kind of like a U.S. ambassador. Right? When a U.S. ambassador goes to another country, when they act in their official capacity, they are to be treated as if they are the president of the United States. Right? They're a, a, a physical representation of the actual office itself. That's what this, this prime minister was, and that was symbolized by the keys. So when Jesus tells a bunch of Jewish folks his followers, I'm giving this one guy keys to the kingdom. They all knew exactly what that meant. He's in charge. 
right? And if, you're, if you, you don't think that maybe Peter was in charge of the apostles or you're not sure why we have a pope and all that kind of stuff, you don't think that's what the, the church believe, just take a look at uh, a few, few things we're going to highlight right now. In Luke 22, in, at the Last Supper, Jesus tells Peter, right, he's telling all the apostles, I'm going to die, I'm going to be crucified, it's going to be bad, it's going to look bad for a while. And then he turns to Peter individually, and he says, Peter, I want you to strengthen your brethren after you've returned, after he returns from his denial. Right, it's kind of, a, it's a very interesting passage, because Jesus is telling 12 apostles, Satan has desired to sift you all like wheat. But I prayed for you, Peter. <laughs> if you're one of the 11, you're like, Jesus, what about, what about me? <laughs> right, Jesus prayed for Peter, why? Because Peter was the guy he's leaving in charge. Of course, Jesus prayed for all of them, but Peter in a specific way. He's the only one that Jesus ever singled out in this way. Similarly, in John 20, in the resurrection scene, the first person Jesus appears to is Mary Magdalene. What does he tell her to do? He doesn't say, go tell the apostles. He says, go tell Peter and the apostles. Symbol uh, signals out Peter again. In John 21, the very next chapter there, Jesus tells Peter personally to feed his sheep. Nobody else is given that direct commandment to, to personally take care of Jesus' flock. The apostles are collectively told that Peter, again, is the only one who's told independently, directly, you are to feed my flock. Kind of interesting, right? Peter is center stage in the first half of the book of Acts. Think about this. In, the, in 27 books in the New Testament, besides the name of Jesus, what is the most frequently occurring name? It's Peter. 155 times. What do you think is second place after Peter? Maybe Paul. He wrote most of the New Testament, right? The second most often occurring name in the New Testament, other than Jesus, I guess the third most frequently occurring name, right? Other than Jesus and Peter is James. There were four people named James in the early church. Two apostles, a brother of the Lord, and the first leader of the Jerusalem church. All right, And that name is only used 41 times for four different people. 155 times for Peter. The early church thought Peter was crucial. Most of the time in the Gospels and the book of Acts, it's Peter and the apostles. Peter and the apostles. Peter and the others. Peter's supposed to be the sure reference point for the church. So Jesus founds his church on Peter and Peter's successors the popes, right? The papacy is the longest running institution in human history. 2,000 continuous years, longer than the Roman Empire, longer than the Ming Dynasty, longer than, insert your favorite long reign here, right? <laughs> longest running institution ever. Why? Because it's divinely instituted. Another fun fact from this thing, Caesarea Philippi. What is going on there? That's actually one of the most important details of this entire passage is being in Caesarea Philippi. Jesus loved using object lessons. Faith the size of a mustard seed. Uh, he used all these, these, these farming parables where people knew, you know, there was, there was an object they could think about. Caesarea Philippi is Jesus's biggest object lesson of his career. What's going on in Caesarea Philippi? Caesarea Philippi is this center of pagan worship for fertility gods. So you can just kind of imagine how they might worship fertility gods uh, in fertile ways, right? Uh, we'll leave it at that. So it's, it's, it's the red light district of northern Israel, right? It's a pagan center of just debauchery and bad stuff. Uh, the Romans called this place the Rock of the Gods because there was this little plateau sort of rock where they, they, so they call that the Rock of the Gods. They built a temple there, a church, if you will, by a rock. And there was this big mountainside beside them with a crevice in it that they called the Gates of Hell. There was a pool in there that they actually believed was bottomless, and it led down to hell. Turns out it's only a few feet deep. I don't know why they thought it was bottomless, but they believed it was bottomless. So they thought this was the Gates of Hell. You've got this church on a rock, and if you do your, your pagan ritualistic rites here, you can control and keep the powers at bay, you know, the powers of hell at bay. So Jesus takes his apostles there. What is he doing? And another key point here. How old are the apostles? We're used to seeing them in Caravaggio's paintings as these old men. The apostles, most scholars think, were teenagers. Peter was probably the oldest at the time of his calling. He might have been 18. John was the youngest. He was probably 12 or 13. So we're maybe a couple years into Jesus' ministry here, one or two years. They're all teenagers. So Jesus takes a bunch of teenagers to the red light district of northern Israel. <laughs> what in the world is he doing? They're probably sitting there thinking, if my, if my dad knows I'm here, he's going to kill me. What is Jesus doing? He took teenagers to the heart of cultural depravity to tell them he's founding a church on a rock, Peter. He's founding a community on a rock, Peter, and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. And their task is going to be to go down in there into the heart of that cultural depravity and change it, change the world. Right? Huge object lesson. Their gates of hell, they don't know what they're talking about. Their church on a rock, not important. I'm founding my church, Jesus founding my church, his church on a rock, Peter. 
and the community that gathers around him, and you're going to go into the heart of cultural depravity and change the world. And they did it. It's a historical fact. We don't have centers of, of worship of Pan anymore. <laughs> right? They're just not there. Christianity swept across the whole world. Right? And you can talk about different parts where it's waxing and waning and whatnot, but it has, in fact, spread all, all throughout the world. So Jesus' promise held true there. Right? They were, in fact, able to change the world. You and I can do it again now. Right now. In the North Hills of Pittsburgh. If we do the same thing the apostles did and rely on Jesus and his Holy Spirit and use our gifts and talents. And that's what confirmation, by the way, is all about. But you can't do it alone and neither can I. It takes a community. Right? Jesus didn't send one apostle. He picked 12 and one of them betrayed him. <laughs> so if you feel like you're not up for the task, you're in good company. All right? Me too. I'm not always up for the task either. It's good because it doesn't just depend on me. And it doesn't just depend on you or us together. It depends on us and God. Think about this ragtag group of apostles, by the way. They didn't get along with each other. I'm certain of it. Right? You had tax collectors in there who worked for the Romans, and you had zealots who were a group in Judaism who was out for the violent overthrow of the Romans. These guys want to kill the Romans. These guys work for the Romans. How are they getting along together? <laughs> right? But they're all in the apostles, and Jesus formed them all together and, and worked with their, their natural gifts and talents and inclinations. The church is supposed to be a community of different believers across space and across time. That's one of the cool things about the church. When you're baptized into this body, you're united with believers from the first century, from the Old Testament times, from insert your favorite time in human history here, right? You're united with King David. You're united with St. Francis of Assisi. You're united with whoever your confirmation saint is. You're part of one body with them across space and time. Mass is what brings that whole body together across space and time. Because in Mass, we time travel. We go back to the cross. If you go back to the cross and I go back to the cross, we're both at the cross together. We're united, right? And then we're receiving the same Jesus. So we're united. You are what you eat, as we talked about a couple sessions ago, right? The, the Eucharist builds the body of Christ, the church. That's what the church is supposed to be. We are at once human and divine. Despite all my flaws and my failures and yours as well, we belong to a, 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 a mystical body that is both human and divine, because Jesus Christ, who's God incarnate, is the head, right? We, we receive God's body and blood. His blood flows through our veins. His breath, the spirit of God, is in our lungs, even though we're fall, frail, fragile human beings who mess up a million times a day, <laughs> and our leaders do too, right? The church is something that is at the same time human and divine, just like Jesus, because we are his body. That's a pretty cool thing. And this community, this is the community that we we're baptized into, and into which you're going to be confirmed. And your, your parents and your sponsors, and in fact, the entire church is supposed to help you grow into that role as a, as a, a, a mature member of the body, as we, we read a little bit last session, right? That's the role of your sponsors. That's why I want you to take some time to think about who is this sponsor that I want, and are they up for this task? Uh, and sponsors, if you're watching this now and you realize, I didn't realize what this role was. <laughs> this is a good time to try to up your game a little bit and figure out, how am I going to do that? Who am I going to get to support me? We all need coaches along the way, right? And your your athletic endeavors and your um, debate clubs and you know whatever activities you're into, you probably have a coach or a mentor. We all need that because we're made for community. We need each other. So who are your spiritual mentors? Who are the people who are guiding you along the way to help you Go into the heart of cultural depravity in your own world and change it for the good. So that's just one of the questions for you to consider here uh, as we, we go into our little discussion time here. Who are your spiritual coaches uh, and who can be a spiritual coach to you now? How can you build real Christian community into your life? That might be through a youth group. It might be through a group of really good friends. Um, how can you do that? What are the issues that you have with the church? Right, we're saying the church is human and divine. You might disagree with the church, and guess what? That's okay. <laughs> Arguing is a form of intimacy as long as you argue towards a resolution and you argue fairly. So what issues do you have with the church? Let's figure those out now. See if we can start finding some answers to some of your questions. Who is Jesus to you? Right? He asked the apostles in this, who do people say that I am? Who do you say that Jesus is? And do you want to be confirmed into this church? So I invite you to take some time now to consider those questions.